Are we, uh, for the folks that can see over the screen there, are we, are we on the record right now? Are, is the transcription running? Okay. So here's the thing. With the transcription, is you guys know that this is new this year and I think it's been very, very cool. And I've had a lot of questions about how it's working because it is so darn effective. So the way that that's actually happening is there is a live participant of Party Track that is not here. They are off site and it's a court reporting service. So ponder that. Okay. So I'm, I'm, when I'm not at DEF CON, I'm an attorney back home and court reporters obviously sit there and transcribe court proceedings and depositions and very bland and boring types of materials. So there is a team of court reporters that has now gotten to transcribe this for all of us and type the words that have been coming out of all these speakers' mouths like dongs, pumpkin poop, booze. Okay. So it's, it may be one of the more interesting types of projects that they've ever been assigned to. So my question to our court reporter is, what do you think? So how about just one more time for our court reporter here in Party Track, let's make applause show up on that screen. Awesome stuff. I'm going to be taking off pretty soon. You guys have been great. Party Track totally rocks and I will probably see you all next year. Without further ado, we are going to learn something about exploit e exploitation detection systems now. Have a good time, everybody. Hello, guys. Hello, girls also. <laughs> girls mainly. <laughs> um, today I will talk about um, exploitation detection system. Um, first, uh, I am Amr Sabit. I am from Egypt. Uh, I am a malware researcher at QCERT in Qatar. I am the author of uh, some uh, open source uh, projects like SRDF, I will talk about SRDF today, and uh, Book S66 uh, emulator. Um, I wrote a malware analysis paper in Stuxnet about Stuxnet, and uh, that's it. That's my first time here in DEF CON. So, uh, thank you. Okay. Uh, let's begin. Uh, as you all know, pen testing right now um, or hacking right now become different from uh, the security um, compliance that we had. Like um, um, they are not attacking the servers right now. They are not trying to use Metasploit and attacking the server me using nmap and all of these techniques. Right now, most of the attacks are advanced, advanced business threats. They are attacking from the client side. They are using spear phishing. They are attacking the employees of the, the company. And from their clients, from their um, uh, machines, they are attacking the servers. So they, they can bypass most of the uh, security compliance applications, firewalls, our intrusion detection system, intrusion prevention system. They can bypass everything. Um, they use some undetectable malware infecting the clients using HTTP um, connection, HTTPS. So they are bypassing everything. They are bypassing also the antiviruses and all of the security tools right now become useless. So what's the solution? What is the new technology? What's the new era? That's what we are talking today. Uh, the next security technology is, from my point of view, is the exploitation detection system. We are now we need to secure the client like we are securing the server. We need to secure from the client side attacks and the exploits. Um, we need to stop the successful exploitation, stop the using of zero days and make it harder. Actually, 
when the security began, they began with antivirus as a uh, technology, the WoW technology, and after a time it was bypassed, and there is another attack, so they created the firewalls and become very, very powerful, and after a time, bypassed, so they're creating the intrusion detection systems and intrusion prevention systems, and they are now bypassed. So what's the next? The next is the exploitation detection system. That's the era of exploitation detection system. Uh, today, I will talk about the exploitation detection system as a, a new technology, as a new concept. That's what I already talked about. Uh, I will talk about also my tool, my exploitation detection system tool, how it can stop the attacks, how it can mitigate the attacks. Uh, I will talk also about the development, still in the middle, but I will talk about what we reached until now. And uh, I will have a little bit of advertisement for my uh, open source uh, development framework. I will talk about it also. Um, how many people here in, uh, know about uh, assembly exploits, understand all of this? Good, <laughs> not too much, but I will explain everything uh, from zero. No problem, okay. Uh, first we'll talk about why it is, uh, the goals of this tool, how I created and all of this. Then I will talk about the design of this tool um, and the mitigations that it used inside it is to stop all the attack vectors and I will talk about the attack vectors explaining them in details, not in brief, uh, not huge details for everyone to understand and I will talk about uh, the monitoring system, it's also inside the ideas and then the development and my future point of view for ideas. Let's begin. Assembly, as I said, it's created mainly to stop the exploitation as I see most of the attacks now using social engineering and the exploitation, the client side attacks and all of this. So that's, that's what I created this tool for. It stopped the memory corruption exploits. I know maybe you don't know about memory corruption. I will describe it right now. Um, it detects the compromised processes if you have an breeder and a malicious BD file running it and uh, it also exploited your process. So it tried to detect that this process was compromised due to an unknown behavior or has some corruption in its memory. And it stopped that. It prevent or alert uh, someone in the company, the IT administrators or the security team about there is a machine or there is a client has been hacked. Simply, memory corruption is about what if you have a, a, a space of memory and uh, uh, there is a buffer created uh, for, um, there is an application, take the username and password, and he imagined that maximum your name will be 200 characters. No one has a name longer than this, so it creates a buffer for it, and uh, take your username, copy all your username inside this buffer, and he don't check on the size of your username, and then run. Actually, if I send a username with 1,000 bytes or so 1,000 character length, he will write on the 200 bytes of his buffer, and then he will overwrite some other places in memory. This places in memory could be, um, could be uh, if you are, um, could be a pointer to a place in memory, could make some corruption, could be a pointer in a code. Uh, in the stack, something named the stack, has a pointer named uh, return address. The processor or the CPU, after a time, execute, go through this pointer and execute the code that this pointer points to. Um, so if I override this pointer, I can make the, the, uh, the CPU go to another place in, in your application. So if uh, it's something, it checked the password, I can override this pointer and make it return that uh, you, you, are, you win or you, you passed or something like this or your username and password are correct. So I can change the behavior 
of your process using some modification in your memory. And that's what's named memory corruption. Uh, you can know about it more in Corland. Uh, be that's uh, Corland team is a very very good team has uh, 10 exploits talking about uh, memory corruption vulnerabilities how to use it how the people use it and as you see in these pictures I show you that there is an overwrite he overwritten the return address as you see so I can now modify the behavior of this process okay uh, some people will ask, okay, it is good point, but what's the difference between uh, the exploitation detection system and the antivirus? Simply, um, and uh, EDS is not signature based, is not mainly behavior based, it's simply searching the memory for any corruption in it. If there is as uh, unknown corruption or unknown override, you can detect that. Um, it doesn't detect malware. It's not to detect there is a, a new virus or something. It's just search for exploitation. Okay. So there is something before EDS. There is something new. No. Uh, there is compile time solutions, and um, uh, uh, the compile time solutions was. Um, uh, created by Microsoft like uh, uh, GS Cookie. They add uh, a cookie before the return address that we saw in the previous slide to check if it was overwritten or not. Something like this. But the compile time solutions has a problem that it forces everyone to recompile the application to, uh, to, to add this feature. So always there is an exception. There is, will be someone, a uh, developer will not compile with the new technology, so I can buy bustles. There is other runtime solutions. One of them was Emit, who talked uh, about his great tool from two presentations. Um, and there is others. Uh, actually, um, uh, from my interview, I see it's like on-off mitigation. It's uh, you are you are that this action is is a malware or there's an exploit or that's not an exploit. I need something more flexible. It's one layer of uh, of mitigation, layer one layer of defense. He can't know that he was bypassed or not. I will talk about this. Okay. So what? What uh, what we have, what we have, what new things we have. Um, we uh, we have cooperative mitigations. We'll talk about this. We have a schooling system. We have something more flexible to detect exploitation and, and so on. Uh, we have additional layer of monitoring system and and this monitoring system. We'll talk about it. It detects if there is something bypassed the attack, bypassed all mitigations, and there is an attack already working. So it's another additional layer to secure. Uh, simply, um, the design that there is payload detection. Uh, we'll talk about what is shell code and what's robot chain. We have shell code detector. We have robot chain detector. After that, we have the attack vector detector. Um, we have security mitigations for the stack and with heap. Uh, actually, the stack, uh, as we saw in the two slides, uh, it's a uh, place includes some return addresses, and this return addresses, if it was overwritten, it will create a problem. It can change the behavior of the application. The heap has something similar named the uh, vtable. Vtable actually, it's, it has some pointers. Um, of some functions in um, in, a, in a time the processor can execute one of them and if they are also overwritten it will create a problem. Uh, after that we have uh, the screening system and the monitoring system. Okay. Some way. The, the screening system um, is based on three things based on payload detection, based on shell code, based on what you sent in your input. If you sent a, a code or something like this, if you try, if you send a, a, 
um, a robot chain or return address, um, return what? <laughs> uh, also, uh, it includes, uh, it detects the exploitation attack vector. If there is a, a, an attack way he did, if there is something suspicious, try to stop this. Also, it it scans on something suspicious related, suspicious related to this process, like um, like a reader connect to unknown website or create a new process named command.exe. That's a suspicious action, so it uh, it gives more score or higher score for this uh, for this attack or this input. There is something more suspicious. Okay. The monitoring system simply searching for evidence of exploitation. Um, they take there is a bypass already mitigation. There is the, this process was compromised. Uh, there include like unknown dealers. Uh, there is some functions uh, hooked or something like this. There is something unknown running in this process. We will talk about it in details. First, what's shit code? Simply, as I told you, that I can send username 1000 bytes, but um, um, and I can overwrite a return address, and I can also modify this return address to return to my user input, to return to my username. So the processor will execute my username as it's a code. So um, shell code is simply some bunch of bytes I can send as it's a, a username and actually it's an assembly code in bytes. So I can, when, the, when I can modify the return address, I can make the processor execute my username or execute the, the bytes, this bunch of bytes, and this bunch of bytes do an action for myself. So I can control your process, I can send you a code and this code will get executed and I am like, uh, like I am inside your PC. Um, the shell code, um, this? Uh, simply it's first, uh, it gets its place in memory. That's the first thing it do uh, because it's running in unknown space. It's just username copied in unknown buffer. So try to take where it is and then getting the Windows functions to execute like uh, I need to execute a new application, I need to create command.exe, I, I, I need to connect to internet. So it gets the Windows functions to do all of this and then attack. Uh, there is a good article about this and code project. Um, can check it. There is any problem until now? Uh, actually, um, some shell codes uh, are forced to, null ha to not have any null byte or zero. Why? Because when I send the username, uh, the username always is just a string or a text. So the text in Windows finish you, uh, finished with null byte or zero byte. That means that username, your username was finished. So the shell codes should not have null bytes. That's uh, that's uh, a point or most of them. Um, they are sometimes encrypted. If you see Metasploit, how many people here use, use the Metasploit? A lot. Um, actually, Metasploit, when you choose the payload, choose uh, a shell code, you can encode it to bypass antiviruses and all signature based ways. So sometimes shell codes are encrypted and there will be like a, a loop trying to, to describe it byte by byte. So there will be a loop, uh, some code execute uh, in like a cycle. And um, uh, some, some shell codes are forced to be in ASCII, like they are characters A, B, C, and so on, because some, some applications that check if the username includes some unknown bytes. Um, that's it. Um, so we need to detect that this username, this this person name includes some shell code, includes some uh, code inside it. 
and uh, he tried to modify the, the application behavior to run this shellcode. So I created a shellcode detection tool. My goal in this tool is to be very fast because this input will be sent in small time and an action will happen after that so I don't need to have a memory console, uh, any time use. I need it to be very hard to bypass, need to be very strong and uh, have some false positives but low as, as I can. So um, I added uh, static shield code detection. Static shield code means it just uh, maximum disassemble or just check the bytes. It doesn't try to when it detect the shield code, it doesn't run it. That's the mean of static. It doesn't run the shield code. It just scan on it, disassemble it, convert it to assembly, and try to understand if it's really uh, an assembly code or or it's just a bunch of bytes and. Um, we divide this shell code detector into three phases. The first phase that we, we search in this username an indication there is, there is a code, there is a working code. And we will detect how we can do this. Like we detect there is a loop, a working loop inside. There is something, yes, if I disassemble all of these instructions, I find a jump, jump to one of these instructions and the code is simply working. That's the first indication of possible shell code. The second, um, I filter all of the uh, of the instructions that um, invalid or some CPU instructions that are corrupted or not used in the in the normal process. And then I do some flow analysis on all of this shell code. If this if this code will work fine or it will it will not work. It's just a bunch of bytes. Thank you. <laughs> Why'd you stop speaking? <laughs> what I say? Go. <laughs> Let's take a break. <laughs> <laughs> You know the uh, you know the drill. What are we called? No, it's not. Fuck the speaker. I don't know what. <laughs> Shot the noob. What what are you doing? All right. Oh, and we need we need who's first time it. <laughs> I think the guy here in front actually got there first. So, all right, here you are, sir. Wait, wait, wait. I want to interview him. What? Oh, yeah, we have to interview him first. Okay. What's your name? Orbo. Where are you from? Utah. Why'd you come to DEF CON? Why are you drinking? Because <laughs> I'm not Mormon. Oh, all right. Why are you in Utah? <laughs> all right, cheers. Uh, all right, cheers to everybody. First time at DEF CON. <laughs> How's he doing? How's he doing? Should we invite him back next year? That was a big one. Five minutes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we're we're taking this. Uh, I will take it. No. <laughs> Wait, is this yours? No, no, no. It's not mine. I'm just joking. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> I don't know, but we'll just leave it there for the next. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, guys. What we said? <laughs> uh, that's the shell code detector. <laughs> okay. Um, we uh, search for indication of a shell code. First, we search for a working loop. How it work? Uh, actually. Um, the assembly code uh, for x86, uh, each instruction has a variable size, like instruction have three bytes, instruction have five bytes, and so on. So what we are doing is 
we disassemble from uh, from a place to to our research for a jump to something previous and disassemble between all of them if uh, the assembly code works fine that the last the last instruction end before the jump so it means that it's something it's it's a, a real loop so the jump is here pointing to an instruction and all of this instruction we're running and we'll we we'll return to this jump and so on we search for something like this it seems that it's a working loop that seems a shell code that's just an indication we check for uh, for there is in some shell codes they call to something to address in previous uh, why to try to uh, using a simple way to 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 get uh, where they are in the in the memory uh, I don't know I don't need to enter the details but we can detect there is a call to something previous and disassemble between the call and between the destination so we can know that it's, it seems a, a, a working loop or something like this. We check also on some loop instructions inside the exit 6. Uh, that's the first way to indicate there is a, seems a shell code or something. Then um, if we didn't find the loop, we search for high rate of an unknown instruction named push. Usually it was used in uh, in um, the or shell codes that it must be an ASCII, must be to be characters A, B, C, something like this. Uh, and um, we detect there is a high rate of these pushes and after that uh, uh, usually the shell codes that include pushes, it push instruction save a, a, a value inside the stack so if you have hundred of pushes and then call to the stack it simply it, it could be like an, an encryption way or or a shell code encrypted and will will describe all the shell code in the stack and then call to it so we can detect something like this and also we have uh, an instruction named uh, fistin that's an assembly instruction but it's used uh, very much with uh, with shell codes because it detects where they are the shell code. So with all of these three ways, we can uh, see that it seems a shell code here. That this assembly or this person name is suspicious. Then uh, we skip some invalid instructions. Some of these instructions in, out, and all of this are related to uh, devices and are used in the kernel mode of Windows, used by the device drivers, are not used by normal applications. And some of them, some instructions has unknown behavior, some crazy things in, in Intel assembly. But we skip all of these instructions if we found them, so the shell code. So uh, if we found the shell code has these instructions, it seems corrupted or something. And then we do some follow analysis. Uh, simply, if you have a, a, a loop, uh, the loop should have, if it saves a, um, something in the stack, it should get the value that it saves in the stack because stack is like a, it's like a cup of water. You add to it and then you take from it. So you can't fill it until it overflowed. You, ju you just you need to add to it and then take what you added. So if you have a loop, you should have a push and pop. You should have something add in the stack and, and another instruction take from the stack. So we check on this. Uh, we uh, check on uh, compare and jumps and all of this. We check for the null three bytes. Um, after this, uh, after I designed this shell code and after I wrote it, I tested it in some false positives and some real shell codes in Metasploit. For the false positives, uh, I detect that four percent of the of the shell codes of four four percent of junk data it detected as uh, a shell code that's uh, uh, it's not a very high level of false positives but not few but um, it detects all metasploit shell codes it can detect them it can detect the the shell storm shell codes uh, famous website for shell codes 
that actually manual elevation is still possible. Um, Ruby chain, it's simply uh, return oriented programming and as you can see it's, um, it's simply when there's uh, uh, some uh, mitigation windows created named data execution prevention uh, prevent the, the users from uh, prevent any data sent as username or something like that to be executed. So some people uh, try to return inside the application itself and try to find very few instructions uh, after this instruction the return instruction and to um, to make a call return, call return or return to some instructions and then return to another some instructions inside the code section of the application and another and another and collect these small pieces together to create a working shell code from the code of the um, of the application. So it can bypass the data execution prevention and it can have a working shell code. We detect all of them easily. We check if the address is in the, um, we check if the address in the executable module. We check the return ad, it's, it's, a, it's a return after a call or not and all of this. Okay. Um, for the stack mitigations, we detect there is, um, we have a mitigation named wrong module switching and it's simply, we detect that there is a, um, um, there is a, a, a return to a Windows API. The Windows functions or Windows APIs are some functions created to, uh, in, created by Windows to uh, do some stuff like creating uh, an, a new process or something like this. We check if there is a call to it or it's a return to this call. If there is a return to this API, so it seems a return oriented uh, programming or seems an attack. Um, we talk about return or robot attack. Um, most of the, of this uh, type of attack vector, what they do to bypass that execution prevention, they create some pieces of, uh, of, uh, of robot attacks or robot judges as we described it, some piece of codes. This piece of codes call to a uh, virtual, virtual protect ABI or some other ABIs. Virtual protects can make the stack executable so or so they can use the rob uh, the rob judges to create uh, to call to virtual protect to make the the username that i i entered as a shell code uh, or the shell code inside my username become executable so i can return to the shell code and bypass that execution prevention so what we do is we hook uh, the calls to the system uh, um, there is a kernel mode that include the Windows device drivers and the process, the process connect to the, the Windows kernel mode using an instruction named system enter. We are hooking here and do stack backtracing, check every caller to this, uh, to, to, to system enter, check the caller to system enter and the caller to the caller until we reach if there is a call from the application to this API or there is no caller, so it's return oriented programming. Uh, actually, um, in Windows 32, we can hook the SSD hooking, but in Windows 64, uh, we don't, we, we can't create a device driver that hook the SSD hooking. So we hook uh, the, the Windows emulator, WoW 64 emulator, we can hook any function calling to the kernel mode, system enter and something like this. We hooking virtual protect and all of this protection uh, ABIs and the, the, the creating process and should execute this could execute an application so I can, so the attacker can execute uh, command .exe for example, we hook these functions. We hook the functions that will uh, create a socket or connect to the internet and all of this stuff. Um, what we do exactly after we do the backtracing and reach uh, uh, the, the call to this application, to, to call to this CBI in the application, we check if this call is really a call uh, to this CBI or that's a fake return address created by the attacker. 
we do some checks like uh, we check if there's a call to the CBI or not. We check the parameters if that's if really what we saw in the parameters are the parameters that created by this uh, ABI caller, the application uh, call to the CBI with these parameters or not. We will see this again. We check if the the application itself has a, a, a call to uh, the, the the function that calls to the CBI. We check another things. Um, and after that, we give a score to the CBI. Yes, that's a call to the CBI or not. Um, we check on different type of, of calls to detect there is really a call to the CBI. Um, we check there is uh, the parameters. We check if really uh, if there is a constant parameter. Uh, the, the the process give it to the CPI like uh, it gives an a parameter um, like uh, gives the name of the process actually give uh, create process it has a, a create process API and it gives to create process API a parameter uh, a specific application and the attacker try to use this part of, of the code and try to give it another parameter we can detect the something like this we will see right now. Let's see the demo. Sorry. Uh, I hope it can work. Anyone see anything? Anyone see anything? Okay. Uh, I don't see a red problem. Uh, simply, um, we begin by uh, we have Firefox API, Firefox application, and we try to um, okay, um, uh, we try to uh, hook this API and uh, hook uh, the the Firefox and uh, check if if we uh, if we run an application using Firefox, if there is uh, a real call to this API or not, or this, uh, is it really Firefox who run this application, or uh, it's a, a fake call or something. We first uh, hook the, the application, and then we here click on application in Firefox, so we, we force Firefox to execute an application or create a process, and then we check on the on the parameters of this, uh, I don't see the video, but no problem. We check on the parameters. We check on the call stack. We do some stack backtracing and check on the call stack, and check on the parameters. It checked the score, and we saw the score is two. So it's a, it's a normal call. Um, and then uh, I don't see anything, but uh, okay. Sorry. Um, I made a. Um, I made a vulnerable application, small vulnerable application, which uh, not call to uh, shell execute. It gives an input and return to shell execute. So um, I tested it. Uh, okay. Um, I run the application, and it's a uh, vulnerable. It gives the message that in the call, in the in the code, and then it should return to shell execute, which execute a function. So we check this, and um, it detects there is a there is no call, and um, uh, it detects there is an attack and gives a high score, so it can stop this attack. Uh, and then we have uh, a CH mitigation. Simply, we check if the structures exception handling is working fine. And then we have some mitigations for heap. Um, we detect the heap overflow, heap spray, heap user after free. Uh, we hook the the Gmail lock, the global lock, the, the the function that allocate in the heap, and all of this. And 
we detect that we add some cookies on each allocated buffer and try to detect if there is a, uh, an overflow to this buffer in the Hebrew net. And um, for um, for Hebe spray, we, we try to detect uh, there is a large memory allocation in very small time from the same module and try to stop this heap spray, we, we scan for shell code and robot chain. If we found the shell code and robot chain inside, so it's simply a heap spray. And we detect use after free. Uh, uh, for, uh, we detect uh, there is a use after free. Uh, if there is um, a class including some uh, pointers or creating something in V table, we try to make this buffer uh, freed after a, uh, we delay it's free so we can. Uh, we can stop any use after free. Um, and then um, we have the scoring system. We describe the scoring system. We stop the, 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 this all type of attacks using our scoring system. We try to take the payload and the attacking vector and all of this. Uh, and then if we, if we didn't find it's a, a real attack, we can at least mark it as suspicious and give it to the, the the administrator. We have the monitoring system, and the monitoring system we check if, if all of our mitigations was bypassed. We check the executable place in memory. We check um, uh, check if there is executable place in, in the stack. There is executable place in heap. There is executable place in memory map the files. So it's something suspicious. We search for robot chains in the memory and shell codes and all of this stuff. We check if there is a thread running outside. Um, running outside the memory and all of this. Uh, what we are planning for, we are planning to create a, a, to, in any company to have a central server which get all the logs from all of the exploitation detection system applications inside the, the clients inside the company so they can get some information from all of this, detect if there is a, a suspicious action happened on all of the clients and then uh, using also uh, correlate all of this information with the intrusion detection system and all of these tools, they can create a timeline of an attack. They can detect there is an attack and contain it. Um, that's the, the future work. Um, okay. Development, uh, it is, is based on security search and development framework. It's a, a development framework I already created. Um, until now, it's included three contributors. It's simply, it's a development framework written in C++. It's for Windows right now. And uh, we, we couldn't uh, include a, a version Linux and version Python. Simply, uh, SRDF is a development framework for writing security tools. This development framework includes a bunch of security tools inside it. It includes a PE and ELF parser, include a PDF parser, including Android parser. It includes for static analysis uh, a full assembler and disassembler engine and uh, Delvic Java disassembler. It includes some wild, some wild card scanning and all of this. It includes for dynamic scanning, full process analysis, debugger, full debugger, and uh, an emulator. It includes for behavioral EBI hooking and all of this. Simply, um, uh, SRDF uh, is a development framework. You can build your application using it. It will, you will not waste your time if you have an, an idea and you need to implement it. You, do, you will not waste your idea. You can use the, the SRDF and uh, implement your idea easily and don't waste your time on creating and uh, reinventing the wheel and creating all of the tools. We have network analysis, uh, we have packet capturing, decision uh, analysis and all of this. Um, I will talk about it in details in Virus Bulletin. Uh, just join us, that's the website, the, the GitHub version join SRDF or use it. Um, um, you can reach us for exploitation detection system. If you need to support this idea, if you have a feedback, if you have any question, uh, if you have anything, just, uh, just email me or uh, uh, send me on Twitter or anything. 
Um, that's it. EDS, exposition detection system, in my opinion, it's a new era. Um, uh, just uh, all people should jump to something like this. That's the new technology that what, which will can stop the ABT attacks. Uh, join us. Thank you. Thank you.